Hi. I guess as you can tell, we're in a television studio. We've just finished a whole day of shooting the commercials for our campaign. I hope you get to see them, first because they're good, but secondly because they tell you a lot about the campaign for change that we've been running across America for the last year. I thought today you might like a brief report from the front. How is a campaign that's advocating fundamental change in the way America works doing out there in Iowa and New Hampshire and all across the country? Well, I think it's doing well. People are anxious about the changes that they know need to be made in America. They're talking to us about those changes. The other day I met a farmer in a little tiny town called Kelly, Iowa, and he was talking to me about education. He said, you know, the problem in our little town is if you get a bad third grade teacher in your school, every one of your kids has to go through that classroom before they can become fourth graders. He said, maybe there's a way the government could help us avoid that problem so we get a really good education for our kids. Well, you know, that farmer named Bob's got it about right. 60, 70 years ago, when we started public education systems in America, we decided to let the government run the schools for us. The government would tell us which schools we were permitted to go to and what courses we'd take and what we'd study, and we'd pay all teachers the same and all students would take the same curriculum study the same courses and read the same books, and it sounded so fair and tidy and even. But you know, we've shortchanged the young people of this country. A study was recently done out in Iowa where we have almost the best schools of any state in the Union. The researcher concluded that America was 10th or 11th in the world in the quality of its education. He said, Iowa schools are almost the best in America but on an international scale, they're just approaching mediocrity. Well, you know, and I know, that mediocrity isn't good enough. We can't be number one in opportunity if we're going to be number 12 in education, so we've got to improve our schools, and parents in America know that. And what we ought to do is put some competition and choice into those schools. Instead of a government monopoly with the government telling us where we go to school, why don't we let parents make that choice? Why don't we give every parent in America a little ticket, a voucher, that says, here, take this voucher and take it to any school in your community that you want your child to go to, a public school, a parochial school, a private school. We want you to have the power to match up your son or daughter with the best school. The youngster that needs math goes to the school with the best math. The one who needs a little more discipline to the school that maybe is more interested in basic values. Well, that's a good idea. Our campaign's the only campaign that supports that idea. I think that would help Bob in Kelly, Iowa, get a better education for his kids. And you know, I was in Berlin, New Hampshire the other day, and that's a little town up in the north country, way at the top. And I was campaigning in a bakery, and I met the owner, a woman named Janet Terrio. She told me she got up at 2.30 in the morning to bake the cinnamon buns and the donuts for the men and women who go to work in the mills at 6 o'clock in the morning. And I said, Janet, you're really working hard. And she said, yes, I am, because she said, I'm worried about my retirement. She said, that Social Security check may not be there when my turn comes to retire. Well, Janet Terrio understands something about America. You know, Social Security is loved by the American people because it's good, because it's right, and because it works. But Social Security works today because of a bunch of people called baby boomers. There's twice as many of them as there are of my generation. And that's why Social Security works, because so many of us are paying in many more than are getting retirement checks out. But when they, those baby boomers retire in about 40 years, that equation's going to reverse. When the baby boomers retire, there'll be twice as many people getting benefits out as there are putting checks in. And then Social Security isn't going to work anymore. Don't you think we ought to fix that? Don't you think we ought to make the retirement of the next generation of Americans secure? People like Janet Terrio think so. Why don't we let people open an independent retirement account, something called a financial security account, and you put money in it, and we'll give you a tax credit for what you put into it so it doesn't cost you anything. You'll still pay your Social Security taxes, and so Grandma's check will come every month but you'll have a nest egg of your own, an account that you invest in and you watch it grow and you make the decisions and when you retire, 
you'll have a, so a retirement income much bigger than Social Security could ever pay you, and maybe you'll have a little nest egg to pass on to your kids. Now, that's a good idea. People who have retirement accounts of their own can get a better deal. And people who want to stay in Social Security can be sure that their checks are guaranteed. That's an American solution. It trusts our judgment. It empowers us to take care of ourselves. It creates a pool of savings. It provides a way to make tomorrow a little bit better than yesterday. But our campaign's the only campaign that even talks about Social Security. And then most delightful of all, I was asked one day in a town called Huxley in Iowa to preach a sermon. I was in a, a Lutheran church and I was a little uncomfortable up there behind the, the, uh, the pulpit, but I did my best. And afterwards, a 90-year-old woman named Minerva Anfinson came up to me and she kind of pulled me down so she could whisper in my ear and she said, young man, I heard you talk about getting rid of agricultural subsidies. And she said, you know, you're right. Why, she said, 50 years ago when they began that subsidy program, I knew it would never work. She said, you can't replace the law of supply and demand with a government program. That's a lot of wisdom rolled up into one paragraph, but Minerva Anfinson's right. For 50 years, we've been subsidizing the price of corn and wheat and cotton. Today, it costs the taxpayers $26 billion a year. Food prices are higher than they need to be and 400 family farms a day are going under. We've mired the American farmer down in the mud of a, an unworkable government program. I think we ought to change that. Most people in America think we ought to change that. We ought to phase those farm subsidies out over five years and give the farmer a chance. He can outplant, outharvest, and outsell any farmer in the world if we'll let him. Let's phase those farm subsidies down. That'll bring opportunity to the farm. That'll lower food prices. That'll save taxpayers $26 billion a year, and that's a good idea. Well, people across the country are concerned about issues like those, and, and some more, too. How about our welfare programs? You know, welfare today is not some kind of a symbol of our caring, some kind of, kind of a commitment to the poor and the downtrodden. Welfare today is a prison, a prison in which the poor are stripped of their dignity and denied opportunity. We ought to do something about that. We've said to people on welfare, don't try to think there's a better day coming tomorrow. Don't try to help yourself. Don't take care of your families and don't worry, we'll take care of you. But we've failed them. You know that and so do I. Why don't we, we replace that failed government program called welfare with a proven traditional value? Something that's been with us since 1776. Something called work. I'm not talking about workfare. I'm not talking about a temporary program. I'm not talking about an experiment. I'm talking about a simple, permanent replacement of welfare with work. Welfare checks stop, paychecks start. And the policy of this country becomes, if you don't work, you don't get paid. Now, you can go out and find a job if you're on welfare. And if you can't find one, we'll give you one. The policy of the country becomes everybody works. That'll bring some self-respect back to poor families. That'll bring opportunity to people who don't have it today. That'll reestablish the family as the nucleus of American society. It'll bring opportunity to an awful lot of youngsters who don't have it today. That's a good idea. And one final thought. Every parent in America knows that the biggest problem facing our schools is drugs. We've got a problem all over America, as a matter of fact. One teenager in four uses drugs recreationally. One truck driver in six that you see going down the highway at 80 miles an hour with those big rigs uses drugs recreationally. 40% of the young doctors in America use them. Two-thirds of the youngsters outside of Washington, D.C. who want to be policemen fail the cocaine test. We've got a problem. And the place to solve that problem first is in our schools. And many people tell us there's nothing we can do about drugs in our schools. Well, they're wrong. There is something we can do. And it's common sense. We've got to send a message to the teenagers of America that's more powerful than the allure of drugs. 
And that message is a little piece of plastic called a driver's license. And let's say to teenagers in America, if you do drugs, you won't drive because we won't give you a driver's license. Let me tell you, I've used that line in high schools all over America, and it gets pretty quiet. We've got their undivided attention. It's a good idea to say if you're going to be drug free, you can get a driver's license. Otherwise, you can't. So we do some random testing in the schools. And if a youngster didn't pass the test, we'd verify it, yes. And then we'd tell their parents right off, and then we'd give them an opportunity to go into a rehabilitation program so they wouldn't destroy their lives. But we'd also say to them, you can't get your driver's license till you're 18 instead of when you're 16. Our campaign is the only campaign that has a creative and sound idea for breaking the link between classrooms and drugs. Well, the people of this country have heard those ideas. And you know, I think they like them. I think they're reacting positively. And the task of our campaign is to make sure that everyone in America knows there's a campaign that's supporting those kind of changes. Replacing welfare with work, driving drugs out of our classrooms, eliminating farm subsidies. Now, you know, I talk about those subjects every day out on the campaign trail. But not nearly as many people are going to hear me talk as are going to see the television commercials that we made in this studio today. And that's where you come in. I need your help. I need your resources, your contributions, so that everybody has a chance, particularly in Iowa and New Hampshire, to see those commercials, to understand that we want to replace welfare with work and why, to understand that we need to bolster a retirement system that isn't going to work for the next generation of Americans. To understand that if we're going to have a prosperous country, we've got to get back to the value of work and the value of family. And that the only way we can do that is to replace a failed welfare system with work. You can help. It'll make a big difference to our campaign, yes. But it'll make a big difference to our country, too. And that's pretty important. Thanks for listening.